What is up, buddy? Thanks for hanging out with us on this Friday. Snowy in our area. Uh, I'm going sledding once we get off tone. Uh, are, are, are you really? I'm taking. We're taking our little niece. Uh, she's here today, and we're going to take her sledding <laughs> as we get out of here. So I'll okay, probably be all cute. bang. I'll be all banged up Monday. You'll be like, "What happened to Rob?" Well, you'll know what happened. It wasn't a bar fight. It was sledding. So there you go. All right. Uh, joining us right now, I, I, his coverage is amazing for NBC Sports Philadelphia. You can follow him on Twitter at d zingaro nbcs. Also, the excellent podcast with our buddy Ruben Frank, Eagle Eye Dave. What's going on, my man? DZ, hey, how is going doing? on? I'm, I've been watching the snow out, out my window, and Rob is funny. I, I remember like one of my most vivid memories as a kid. I went sledding with my friends like the big hill in our town, and the township used to put like these metal rods with like the orange stuff, like to keep you on the like the little jumps, basically like on the hill. Oh yeah. yeah. And one time I went off the side of this thing, and I like slammed into the the metal pole and it was like Ooh. the most pain i'd ever been in my life so good luck today is what i'm saying <laughs> oh my god man I, i'll tell you what we used to do so like the older guys these guys were nuts man i, I don't even know how they did this the older guys would get i'm not even kidding you hoods of trucks on this big hill we lived I, I lived like if you walked like 15 minutes you could get to a golf course and golf courses had the golf course had this big drop so these dudes got the hood of a car and they'd they'd go down on the hood of a car. So they let us do it. And and Dave, I had the same thing. Like I so it's me and my my two buddies, and we're on this thing and we're flying. And you had to like hit this little footbridge just right, or you were going into a creek. Okay. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. So thank God we were careening right for the creek. My one buddy just grabbed me and like it was almost like one of those like movies where you jump out of a moving car. And we got off at the last second before that bad boy went into the creek. It could have been, could have been curtains. So I think I don't think I'd be sitting here having oh, the pleasure, my God. pleasure of talking you to you guys today. But anyway, uh, all right, Dave. We just did a little role playing exercise. Tone and I did where we were sort of like Jeffrey Howie in the interview today with with Nick. If, if you could ask Nick one question to start off with about the way the year went or anything specific, what would be your first question for them for him? Mm. Yeah, it's funny because I, I think like those answers are important. Like, how did you let this thing snowball to the point that it did? Um, and, and like from that aspect of it, I think the important thing to ask is basically like, why didn't your culture prevent this? Mm. Like, it's one thing to get into scheme and play calling and all of this stuff, but the big reason you hire Nick Sirianni, look, I, I know he's an offensive coach and he takes pride in his offense, but one of the big reasons you hired him was because of his ability as a coach to connect with players, to get the most out of them. He believes that the more guys are connected, the harder they play for each other. Why did that culture not prevent this tailspin? And I know the culture alone can't do it and there are mm -hmm. other elements to it, but that's what I would want to know. Uh, and I don't know if, if there is an answer for that, but like if you're looking at the past season, that's the biggest question I have. Now, there are obviously schematic questions, but that's more about stuff going forward. And, and honestly, I think that stuff is more important when you're talking about like the past or the future. Unfortunately for Nick, like he's going to walk in there and say, I've taken you to three playoff appearances. We went to the Super Bowl. But you don't keep a coach because of what he's done. You keep a coach because of what you think he can do. Mm -hmm. um, and and certainly like the resume aspect plays into that because he's proven he can be successful in this league. The question is, can he be successful with this franchise moving forward? Does he have a plan in place to make those things happen? And that's really what this meeting should be about. You know, Dave, uh, thanks again for coming on. Um, Jalen Hurts has been kind of getting a little bit of criticism because of his not so ringing endorsements of, uh, Nick Sirianni, he's kind of been very stoic, very Jalen Hurts about it, right? Um, do you believe Jalen Hurts believes that Nick Sirianni is the guy that can help him take his game to the next level? It's a fair question. Uh, I think with Jalen, we have to be very careful about reading too much into his answers in a public setting, uh, just because he's pretty much guarded about everything. You know, I like it, it, it's not like this treatment has been reserved for Nick Sirianni in this moment. He's right. kind of taken that tack with 
everything since he's been in the league. I do agree with it on some level that like, hey, man, if this is your coach, go back him up and, and say that publicly. But that we know that's not really uh, Jalen style. So um, I think there are questions as to whether or not Nick is going to be able to bring the most out of Jalen. What I will say is like he has, right? Um, whether it was a combination of Nick, Shane, Brian, um, that group got Jalen playing at an MVP level. Heck, he was an MVP front runner this season, and he wasn't even playing that well, but like he was at that level this season. So uh, I think he's had the ability to help Jalen. I think Jalen's a much better player than when he got here. Is there a chance that Hurts is looking at this saying, I don't know if if there's a chance that we're going to get to the next level with this guy? I think those questions might be in the back of his mind, but it's, it's really hard to know. And I think it's like a dangerous game uh, to read too much into what Jalen's saying. I think we can look at it at base level and say, well, this offense didn't get the most out of any of these players mm. this year, right? I mean, this is an offense that is super talented. This is an offense that brought back nine of 11 starters. This is an offense that had an MVP quarterback, two stud receivers, the best offensive line in football, a top five tight end, and a Pro Bowl running back. And they were barely a top ten offense. Yeah. That's so, well, Dave, then then I, I probably buried the lead here. Gut feeling. Do you think he's back? Do you think Nick survives this? Uh, my gut all, for a lot of this time has been no. Okay. Mm. Uh, but it's really like that. My gut has been no because I look at it and I think. Um, offensively doesn't have the answers. He, he kind of doubled down. It, it, it really comes down to what he says in this meeting. And I don't know what he's going to say. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Nick is, is a proud person. Um, if I'm Nick, I walk in there and say, Hey, the two coordinators that I brought with me helped us get to the Super Bowl. Let me hire my own guys now. And she go in there with names and say, these are the guys I want to hire. I think we can change the, obviously, defense is different, right? I don't think defense will be the sticking point. I think defense is like, hey, let's agree on a guy and kind of give the, the keys to the defense to this guy, whoever it is, and let him fix it. Uh, offense is trickier because Nick takes pride in his offense. And uh, this scheme was too basic this year. The, the, the offense was predictable. The rest of the league caught up. And I don't know how willing he's going to be to change the structure of a lot of what they do offensively. And if he's not, and Jeffrey doesn't like the direction it's headed, then I think that could be a contentious area between these two guys. That's uh, okay. Let me follow up real quick on that tone. because that, That's something to me that I think is a very interesting bone of contention, because even if you believe Brian Johnson was just straight up calling the plays, we're led to believe that Nick is scheming this thing up. And I, you know, the scheme, frankly, left a lot to be desired, in my opinion. Would he be willing to totally step back from that and, and just really be the ultimate CEO? Like he's not even really get his hands all that dirty, although he has input. I get it. But whomever is calling the plays next year, whether it's a new offensive coordinator or Brian Johnson, Nick's not involved in the in this, the, the, at least the, the primary scheming. I don't know that like that's to me where it might be tough for him to extract himself from that, too, Dave. No, what's he doing? Yeah, right. Uh, at that point, like, I, I think he has to be willing to change his offensive philosophy, mm -hmm. right? And, or at least incorporate a lot of elements that they weren't in, incorporating this year. Uh, game, you're right. I mean, and and it, Brian Johnson got so much grief this year, but he's he's kind of handcuffed a little bit at times. I don't know how well he would do in a different scheme. And it is fair to say, well, Shane Steichen didn't seem to be handcuffed last year. Right. Uh, but I did get the sense at times this year that Brian was trying to work with what he had. And it's a difficult situation to be an offensive play caller under an offensive head coach. that's not calling the plays because there were also moments too, where, you know, Nick's kind of dictating what types of plays they're going to run. And I, I think that makes it really tricky. I, if if Nick is not involved in the offense, there's no reason to keep him here. I, mm. it, there aren't coaches like that who are just not. I mean, very rarely. And 
it, I don't think like in-game management is the biggest part of being a head coach, but I don't think Nick has been particularly good at that either. And part of handing over the play calling was to free him up on game day to, to make all these really tough decisions. And I think he's been okay. Like I, I think it, there have been moments where, man, he's made some weird decisions, whether it's being uh, not aggressive enough, whether it's kind of messing up time management things like those are, it, it's not like the, you don't fire a guy because of that. But when you're starting to like pile up the reasons, I think that goes on to that side of it. Uh, that he hasn't been great in game management situations. He'll have a if he's here, he's going to have a role in the offense, a big role in the offense. It's just whether or not he's willing to kind of change some of his philosophies if he realizes that it, it was a problem because he can't go in there and say, "Hey, we have a top ten offense." Because Jeffrey Lurie's been, why is it only a top ten offense? Mm -hmm. You should be an elite <laughs> offense. And it hasn't been a top 10 offense in right. weeks. You're, you're resting on the laurels of the first 10, 11 games. That's the other part. And I guess, I guess, I'm sorry, Tone. I just, the no, only no, no, fine. if you're taking all that away, like, it's like, what do you do? What are you really here for? Yeah, you, yeah. You know? That's a good point, Rob. And, you know, and also, Dave, it's interesting that you say, you know, your gut's telling you he's not back. Um, you know, I was speaking to our guy, John McMullen, last night. Um, he thinks he likely is to be back. So I'm curious to know. Um, what's the temperature amongst you and your colleagues, right? I mean, this this situation clearly has a lot of the city, a lot of uh, the fan base, a lot of reporters split on how this thing may pan out. So um, amongst your colleagues, the people you've been around, you know, these past several weeks, what do you think the temperature is amongst amongst those guys among, uh, when it comes to Nick Sirianni's future? Yeah, it's split, certainly. And, and like, I am, I say that's my gut, but it's like, you know, 55, 45 thing. Right, like, I'm right, just right. leaning that way. I don't think anyone is anyone who's around the team is really one side or the other heavily. Uh, and we were kind of taking a straw poll um, among ourselves, like walking. I, I was actually walking with John, I think. And he said, what do you think? And I went thumbs down, but uh, he went thumbs up. But like, I think it, it is close and it's really tough to know because it's not just like I mentioned this. It's not just about what's happened. It's about the plan for what will happen. And that's and we my don't concern. Know what that plan is. You know what I that's mean? That's my so. major concern, Dave. That's my major concern. It's not about what has happened. Can, can they afford to go through another season with Nick and he still can't provide you with the answers that scares me. Yeah. It's, it, it's an interesting thing. And like, uh, it's hard to not look back at 2020 and uh, how the Eagles kind of screwed up the timing of that. Uh, Doug was coming back and then wait a second. He's flying down the Florida to meet with Jeffrey. Oh, now he's not coming back. They're not seeing eye to eye. Doug wants press Taylor and you know all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug's plan at that point was not good enough in Jeffrey's eyes for the coaching staff uh, and the team going forward. I don't know where Nick is on that. I don't know if Nick's going to walk in there and pound the table and say, Brian Johnson's my guy. Uh, I don't think, you know, the defensive coordinator, I think he'll probably concede, like, give me a list of names. We'll pick one of these names and we'll go from there. But uh, offense is his baby. And uh, it is kind of a weird dynamic. Again, we're going through this where um, there's kind of a maligned coordinator, but he's getting head coaching uh, interviews across the league and Brian Johnson. I, but like, is it enough to bring in? some kind of offensive consultant. We've seen them try that here before with disastrous results. They tried it in 2020. You guys remember Rich Scangarello coming in and like they, they just had no plan to really blend the offenses. And then eventually Rich is just hanging out doing nothing. Uh, I'm curious to see if, if Nick will have a plan to evolve philosophically on offense, but actually do it. Um, mm. because it's 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 not easy to just blend styles you have to have a real vision for it uh and we've seen we saw that in 2020 heck we saw with the defense this year having two philosophical visions it means you have no vision sometimes if you can't blend them well so i i think those are the big questions that they have to try to get answered and 
I don't know what Nick's answers are going to be. That's the really tricky part about this. I, right. I think he can walk in there with the plan that Jeffrey says, okay, no, I like where this is going. I believe in you as a person because I've seen you uh, lead a room and I've seen you do all the intangible things that I want from a head coach. You need to evolve. And I, maybe he does that. Maybe he comes in with a really good plan and Jeffrey thinks, yes, like we can go forward with this guy. I just don't know what his plan is and, and what he's presenting to the owner right now. All right, Dave. So then let me ask you, let, let's hypothetically say that, that Nick sticks around. He's, they, he stays. Do you think both coordinators are gone? And I'll, I'll even ask that with a caveat of let's say Brian Johnson does not get a head coaching gig. Okay. What the, the point would be moved. Obviously if he does, he's out of here, but let's say he doesn't get that. Are they moving on from both coordinators in your estimation? I think defense is easy. The, yeah. Yeah. That they got to find a new defensive coordinator. Offense is tricky, and it's kind of like, is it is it enough in Jeffrey's eyes to bring in some sort of consultant to help fix the offense? Then you're in kind of a, a lot of cooks in the kitchen scenario because you have Nick Sirianni as the head coach, offensive game plan guy. You might have Brian Johnson as the offensive coordinator. You already have Kevin Patullo, who, as long as Nick here, I. I think the one guy he would bang the table for is Kevin Patullo. He's I mean, he got on the plane with him from Indy. Like those two guys are tied together. Um, you're certainly not getting rid of the offensive line coach and run game coordinator. So like you have a lot of guys already. Uh, is it enough to just bring in coach X and say, well, now your senior offensive advisor, we're going to listen to you. Is that enough in Jeffrey's eyes? And is that enough to change the offense when Nick is still in charge? Maybe. Uh, it would have to be someone that Nick trusts. It would have to be someone uh, who can present things to him in a way that he sees the validity of it. It's kind of like, you know, when a coach coaches a player, if the player sees that it can help them, they're more willing to accept the coaching. Mm -hmm. It would have to be someone that Nick trusts. And it would have to be someone who presents it in a way that he sees how it can help the offense. Because without that, like, Nick's probably not going to do any of those things. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, Dave, um, the Eagles invested, Jeffrey Lurie invested a quarter billion, a quarter million dollars. No, a quarter billion dollars, excuse me. A quarter of a billion dollars into Jalen Hurts. I'm curious to know, by your estimation, how much sway does he have in this entire uh, Nick Sirianni situation? He has some. I mean, because you look at, like, the main players in the organization – Jeffrey's not going anywhere. Howie's not going anywhere. Jalen, by virtue of the contract, is not going anywhere. The guy who, who has the least job security is the head coach and on all the coaches after that. So, uh, yeah, I, it, because of the contract Jalen signed, he, he has a ton of sway. And uh, I don't know if he's going to use it. Jay, I, I am out of the business of trying to figure out what in the heck Jalen Hurts is thinking or saying or doing. <sighs> I, I don't know. I, I've known the guy for four years, and I know him not at all. Uh, and I think mm -hmm. that's obviously by design. But, yeah, he has sway. Um, maybe not to the level of some franchise quarterbacks who have been in a city for a decade. But, right. yeah, there's no question that he has some say in this. If he walks into Je – like, Jeffrey's going to ask him, right? Just like Jeffrey's probably going to talk to some veterans on the team just to get a sense of the locker room. And uh, I don't think that can be a determining factor what any player says, which sounds kind of messed up, but um, the players like the coach. He's a nice guy. I think a lot of people in that building like Nick as a guy, uh, and they don't want to see him get fired, but it's not about that. No one wanted to see Doug get fired. Doug right. didn't deserve to get fired. Jeffrey said that, but it was about was he the right guy to lead the team forward. So I think you have to be really careful sometimes uh, gauging the players because – not that they're trying to lie to you, but they look at the coach and they like him and they don't want to see him go. And I understand that, but which like that matters too, but not as much as whether or not he can help them get back on a winning side of things. Dave, in your estimation, uh, why did the D line, I get the back seven. I don't think there's talent there, but why did the D line underachieve the way that they did? Yeah, I think, uh, well, part of it is the back seven. Right. Like all these things work in unison. If the secondary stinks, they're not given D line time. We know how those things are kind of tied yeah. by a string. I think there was fatigue 
uh, the rotation was not as deep this year as it was last year. You look inside, they brought in Linval and, and, uh, and Dominic and Sue last year. Those guys played a lot of snaps down the stretch. Uh, they didn't have those guys this year. They trade. It sounds it sounds silly to talk about. They traded Contavia Street, and they cut Derek Barnett, who weren't playing very well when they were here, but they were eating up some snaps. Nolan Smith did not grow into the rotational player we expected as a rookie. So inside, he had Jordan Davis playing double the snaps he played last year, and he broke down at the end of the season. He had poor Fletcher Cox at thirty three playing a million mm -hmm. snaps. Mm -hmm. uh, Jalen Carter at the end of a rookie season did hit a rookie wall. I, I don't think there's any question about that. Josh Sweat and Hassan Reddick played a ton. Uh, Josh Sweat played the most snaps of his career. Hassan Reddick played the most as a pure edge rusher in the league. I think those guys broke down. Uh, yeah, I think the Nolan Smith thing to me was a big part of this. I expected him to be the third guy in the rotation. Mm. He wasn't. I mean, yeah. he, he, he barely played this year. Uh, and then you have Brandon Graham. Like, how much are you going to ask a 35-year-old Brandon Graham to play? I think the rotation was just worn thin. And I, I think they really uh, – it took a lot out of them playing that Buffalo game and then the 49ers and, and Cowboys games. I think that three-game stretch just kind of wrecked them from a physical standpoint. Hmm. You know, Dave, you know, there's been – from what I've been hearing, there's been two competing thoughts when it comes to why this team uh, kind of, you know, fell off a cliff. Uh, one side uh, feels as though players should own more of why things went wrong with effort. Um, these guys get paid millions of dollars. Um, they, they shouldn't need a coach to get them up for a playoff game or to get them going for football games that have real relevance to their seating. Um, a lot of people put a lot of the onus on a lot of the onus on the players. On the other side, a lot of people put a, lo uh, a lot of the onus on the coaching and that how can you not get these guys prepared? How, how do you not have answers for the blitz? Um, so on and so forth. So I'm curious to know, how do you balance those two competing ideologies when it comes to accountability and how it should be dispersed between players and coaches? It's really tough. And whenever a season goes bad, you're starting to like look at the blame pie and divvy it up and who deserves this much and this much. Uh, and it's tough to do that because these things work together. Uh, I think coaching clearly was not good enough this year. Right. And I think when coaching isn't up to that level, it, what, at a certain point, the players stop believing in it. And it doesn't mean they quit. It doesn't mean they're not playing hard. But if they don't think the coaches know what they're doing, if they don't think the coaches have a good enough plan, I think that's going to show on the field. And I think that mm -hmm. did uh, at the end of the season. I, I don't think there was a trust in the coaching staff that they were going to put them in the right position to make plays, especially on defense. Uh, that was a mess. I mean, we're going to look back at this season in 20 years and, and say, remember that time Matt Patricia was here and they made him the defensive coordinator in week 10. We're going to go, what were they thinking? Uh, yeah, that, that was a wreck. Whose call do you think that was Dave? Ultimately? I, I think it's a front office call. I don't think, I don't think Nick does that on his own personal. He certainly yeah, doesn't do it on his own. He's not making that, that decision in a vacuum. Um, the front office at least had to be on board with it. So, yeah. uh, but it was a disaster. And if it was Nick's call on his own, that's almost a fireable offense. It was yeah, that, that he bad. better hope it wasn't going into this meeting because that yeah. that is oh that's, that's the first thing I'm hitting him with probably if, if that's the case. Uh, yeah. Do you yeah. think? Weird question. Do you think they'll announce? Like if he stayed, if he's staying, will there be an announcement or or do you just not say anything? It's because you don't lend into like all the speculation that I know that's a weird question. But do you think they put something out saying, "Hey, um, we're moving forward"? Maybe not officially. Yeah, but it'll be leaked to somebody. Uh, th there will be word one way or the other. Like, we're not going to, you know, in a few weeks, we're not going to, I wonder if Nick's still going to be the, like, we'll know um, what their what their decision is. Because if he's back, we know there will be other changes. So, like, once they start moving on that, the word will be out that, yeah, he, he's the coach. They're trying to figure out other coaching staff hires or firings. Uh, and if not, then... At a certain point, you got to jump in here. All these other teams are interviewing candidates, and I, I know the Eagles got a late start last time, and they ended up getting the, a good coach, and they got to the Super Bowl, and everything kind of worked out. But you don't want to be too far behind the rest of the league. Makes sense. Makes Absolutely. Sense. Uh, last Absolutely. one, Dave. Do you think Fletcher Cox is back? I do not. 
uh, base, and maybe I'm basing this too much on what Jordan Davis said this week, but Jordan Davis all but said he was gone. Uh, Fletcher said he, he, you know, he hadn't quite decided yet. He didn't know what his future held. And then Jordan Davis talked to us for 20 minutes just about how great it was to play with Fletch, how much he's going to miss him, uh, how much he wishes they could have sent him out on a better note. So uh, a, a lot of the talk all week has been about Jason Kelsey and likely, very likely saying goodbye to him. Mm -hmm. uh, but another all-time great could be leaving too. And it's going to leave a big leadership void on this team for sure. Yeah. yeah uh, last one for me, Dave, um, really quickly. Um, Jalen Hurts. Um, Last year we saw him take a big jump. This year he took a step back. Uh, just based off all the, everything you've seen, you've seen every game um, in, in, in grave detail. I'm pretty sure you've rewatched several of them. What do you think um, is the first course of action for Jalen Hurts this offseason? What do you think needs to be priority number one in the next stage in his development as getting better as the franchise quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think a lot of it <laughs> – it's just him and the coaching staff being on the same page. So, mm. uh, and I know that's something that he can't like work on with a throwing mechanics coach. Like, I think all that stuff is okay. Uh, I thought some of his bigger problems this year was him not being on the same page with the coaching staff, with the play call. And then I think some of his decision-making was very questionable. Uh, so like I, in years past, you say like, yeah, his mechanics need work. He needs to throw with better anticipation, like all these different things. I think mechanically he was fine this year. Really, I thought he looked slower. I don't know if he can work on that in the off season. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I, I don't think it was like, I don't think there are mechanical things to like. You know, he used to work out with uh, like throwing coach. Like I, I think all that stuff is fine. I think you can refine the technique a little bit, but those weren't his issues this year. Right? I think it was more about. Uh, the flow of the game and him not playing within it and making some poor decisions. So uh, I, I think there are things to work on with this game. I don't think those are things that are super easy to work on, you know, in April in an empty field somewhere. Dave, listen, man, thank you. Uh, appreciate it. We know it's going to be a day where you're on watch all day, but we appreciate you uh, jumping on with us for a couple minutes, man. Keep up the good work at NBC Sports Philadelphia and, of course, your Eagle Eye podcast with Ruben Frank. Thanks, Dave. DZ, thank Thanks, you. Guys. Appreciate Take it. Care. All right, Dave Zingaro, great work out of him. All right, let's get a timeout in here, Tone. Let, we'll go through some of the things that Dave had to say. Definitely. And I also want to dive into the seasonal turning points. You know, things looked really good at 10-1. and 1. What happened? Was there a specific game or moment in a game that led them to what happened here. We'll do all of that when we come back. Don't go anywhere. He's Tony Shields. I'm Rob Ellis. We're Sports Take. All right, let's talk about Jim Murray and Principal Financial Group because finding that right person is everything. You work way too hard not to have your money invested the right way, okay? And I found the right person in Jim Murray and Principal Financial Group, whether it's retirement planning, 401k review, insurance review. You might have a small business and you need help with your employee benefits. That's another resource that Jim can assist you with. I've entrusted my IRA, my 401k rollovers with Jim, and I couldn't be any happier. You will be too. Give him a call, 